Let's be honest with ourselves. 2020 has not been the best of years. When we gathered for the first time in January, we had no idea that a dangerous virus would rampage through this country, causing shutdowns, loss of employment, and mandates from our government to wear masks, wash our hands regularly, and socially distance from one another. When these guidelines came out, I know that some wanted to push back, thinking that they were an overreaction. But these past three weeks in Toronto and Ontario has shown that this virus has not disappeared. And if we're not careful, it can grow to be stronger than it was this spring. Naomi had said, when she looks at the infection rates that's that that is how many people people are infecting who have this virus it's higher right now than it was in march and so we do need to be careful we do need to be vigilant and follow our health protocols no matter how inconvenient they may be not because our government mandated them but as a christian we are told that we are to look out for one another. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I know we don't want to get sick, so we shouldn't want our neighbor to either. So if we all want to resume our normal lives as quickly as possible, this is what we need to do. But even through all this despair, all of this hardship for Christians, we can still find joy. We can still find optimism. We can still find hope. Not because we're so smart, but because we can rely on Jesus to see us through. This morning, I'd like us to examine a song that can teach us some of those principles. So if you would take your hymn books and turn to song number 590. 590. The title is, Jesus is all the world to me. So once we get there, once everyone gets there, let's read through this song. So 590, Jesus is all the world to me. Verse 1, Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He is my friend. Verse 2 continues with, Jesus is all the world to me. My friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings, and he gives them o'er and o'er, which is over and over. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvests, golden grain, sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He is my friend. And then verse 3 concludes with, Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I'll trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life eternal joy. He is my friend. The song itself, if you look in the bottom corner, uh, says it was written by Will Lamartin Thompson in 1904. Thompson was born on November the 7th, 1847 in East Liverpool, Ohio, and died in New York City on September 20th, 1909, making today the 111th anniversary of his death. Now, unlike many of the songs we have examined in the past, where the songwriter is part of this denomination or that denomination, denominations not found in the Bible, Mr. Thompson was a member of the Lord's Church, the church that is found 
in the Bible. His more famous songs are songs we often sing, like Softly and Tenderly, There's a Great Day Coming, and Lead Me Gently Home, Father. But even though we can rejoice that this man truly followed the Lord, let's not praise the man, but instead examine the song that he left us and see how it relates to Jesus and how it can be helpful in our walk with Christ. So you probably, you can put your songbooks down for now because we're going to be going back to scripture. But you notice that each verse begins with the same phrase. Jesus is all the world to me. This phrase specifically contrasts with the attitude that John was dealing with in the book of 1 John, where in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. In this context, the things of the world are the things that lead us to sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John isn't saying that we can't love our sister, or our brother, or our mother, or our father, or our dog, or our house. These things aren't necessarily sinful. He is saying, though, don't fall in love with the pleasures of this world that can lead us to sin. Don't fall in love with the money of this world that can lead us to sin. Don't fall in love with the possessions of this world that can lead us to sin. Basically, don't fall in love with anything that can lead us to sin. Why? Because if we fall in love with those, the love of the Father that which is necessary in order to obtain eternal life is not in us. Moreover, the things of this world will pass away, leaving us with nothing if we've fallen in love with those. However, the love of the Father will remain, and for those who have it, they will possess it eternally in the life to come. But for those who don't have it, the scripture outlines what the punishment will be, and it will be hell, where the love of the Father will never be forever. So how do we obtain the love of the Father? John said, by doing the will of the Father. If we back up in John 2 to verse 3, this thought is further expanded upon. John 2, beginning at verse 3. Now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. If we say that we know God, but we do not keep God's commandments, we're a liar to ourselves and to others. The only ones who know God are the ones who keep his word and walks just as he walked. That means Jesus walked. If you want to know something is right, let's go to the scriptures. Is what we want to do commended in the scriptures? Can we find Jesus doing the things like we want to do? the answer is yes, then we know that we are abiding in the teaching of God. However, if we can't, if the answer is no, then we're not abiding in the teaching of God. Surrendering our minds to God, to Jesus, is an adjustment that each and every Christian, it doesn't matter if you grew up going to church or not, each and every Christian will need to adjust their will to no longer say, my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33, but, the, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Whatever we want to do, God should be coming first. Righteousness should be coming first. If it is not, Jesus is not all the world to us. He might be some of the world to us, but he needs to be all of the world to us. We should actually be concerned with what, uh, sorry, we should actually be concerned about what we're doing. Is Jesus, if he sees us doing these things, will he command us? Will he be pleased with us? Or will he be disappointed? Now, might stopping to consider biblical principles of what we want to do slow down our decision making? Almost certainly. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. For not only will it lead to better decisions in that we won't be trying to just quickly like this impulse our way through life, but it will keep us out of sin. As we grow in making Jesus all the world to us, we'll start to realize something. Jesus is the real reason behind why we can live each and every day the way we do. For we will understand that Jesus is the reason for our life. Not only our physical life, but our spiritual life as well. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you want to get to the Father? You got to go through Jesus. He is the way to the Father. There is no other way. He is the truth. Because he spoke the words of the Father. There is no other truth. And he is the life. Because he is the provider of life. There is no other source of life. Jesus being the life is true on two different levels. Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Jesus was the creator of physical life. If Jesus didn't create mankind, we would not exist, and thus have no access to the Father in heaven. But of course, Jesus is also the creator of spiritual life. John 20, verses 30 and 31 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did Jesus do what he did? Why did he die on the cross for the sins of mankind? So that he could create life again. Not physical life this time. Spiritual life. A life where we could once again be reunited with the Father in heaven, having been forgiven all of our trespasses and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Without Jesus we would not be standing here physically. And without Jesus, we would not be able to stand here spiritually either. If Jesus is all the world to me, we recognize that he is the reason for my life. But we would also recognize that Jesus is the reason for my joy. As I said in the beginning of this lesson, 2020 has been a miserable year. And unless Christ comes again first, it will probably continue to be such. But for the Christian, there are reasons to be joyful. For one, the people of this earth are still able to hear the gospel. In the days of Noah, what did God do to the disobedient? 
He killed them all in a flood. Each and every last one of them. In the days of Lot, what did God do to the disobedient of Sodom and Gomorrah? He killed them all with fire and brimstone from heaven. Each and every last one of them. Without going into what we can't know, which are the reasons that God allowed the coronavirus to become such a threat to us this year, we can at least be thankful that all the wicked were not destroyed. That we still have an opportunity to go out and teach. But make no mistake, a day will be coming when God's patience will run out and this world will be destroyed and all the wicked be cast into hell. But today is not that day, at least yet. Let's therefore be joyful about the opportunities that God has given us. Let's also be joyful that God's church still stands and that we can be built up by our fellow Christians. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. If the gates of Hades, which refer to the death of Christ, wasn't able to stop the church from being built, then the coronavirus, as bad as it is, is not going to stop Christ's church from continuing to be built. Will the church have to adapt? Yes, and we're doing so. As long as our government doesn't tell us to do something that interferes with the word of God. We've separated our worship assemblies into two cohorts, one that meets in the morning and one that meets in the afternoon, recognizing that the church can assemble at different times on Sunday. It's not ideal, and I'm sure we're all looking for the day when we can all meet together, all 45 of us, in one place again. But this setup is better than what some like to call virtual worship, and it is certainly better than not being able to meet at all. We wear masks. We wash our hands. We do not pass trays when partaking of the Lord's Supper or taking a collection. All things that we can do without compromising God's word. Now, public health strongly discourages congregational singing. They prefer that if possible, only one or two people sing maybe a soloist or a very small choir, or we listen to pre-recorded music instead. That we cannot do, for we are all commanded to sing in verses like Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. But if you've watched our services in the past, and of course the members who are here know this, we have cut down the number of songs that we sing, and we can cut them down again if we need to. But through all this, the church still stands. Satan hasn't succeeded in destroying Christ's church, and we should be joyful for that. But we can also be joyful that through ever, whatever hardship we've faced, whether it's illness ourselves, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, that our salvation remains firm. John wrote in 1 John chapter 1. Oops. 1 John chapter 1 verses or sorry, 1 John chapter 5 verses 9 to 13. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given in his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this, is, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He, he who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. We can know that we have eternal life. And the reason that we can know this 
is because we have knowledge of whether we're walking according to the word of God or not. Do you believe in Jesus and do what Jesus said? Then we can know that we have eternal life. We can know that. If we're doubting that, then we, that's a sign we need to start spending more time focused on our spiritual life. Spending more time in God's word. Spending more time in prayer. Because our faith has weakened. This coronavirus has shaken our faith in many things. But our eternal salvation should not have been one of them. God is still in control, and he is still able to save us. And so if Jesus is all the world to me, we can take joy in that. But not only is Jesus the source of my life, not only is he the source of my joy, but he is my all. What does that mean, he is my all? That means that I realize that every day he is my strength. And without Jesus, I would fall. When it comes to fighting off temptation, how are we successful? Through imitating what Jesus did and what the apostles told us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, we read, Therefore let him who thinks he stands Take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I can fool myself that by my own sheer willpower, I can stand on my own two feet and never sin. But no, Paul said in Romans 14, verse 4, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. If we are standing before God as righteous, it's because God's word taught us how to obey, and through faith we've received God's grace. We didn't provide our own way to God. Jesus provided the way. We didn't provide our own truth. Jesus provided us the truth. And we didn't provide our own life. Jesus provided us the life. Without Jesus, we would fall and be unable to get up. Therefore, when I am sad, to whom should I go? I should go to my friend Jesus. For he is able to make me glad through what is revealed to us in scripture and what can be accomplished through prayer. Continuing on to verse two of our song now, we find that if Jesus is all the world to me, that I will recognize that when I face trials, he is there, not as my enemy, but as my friend. Just a few moments ago, we read 1 Corinthians 10 verses 12 and 13. We really only talked about verse 12, learning to rely on God to prevent us from falling. I intentionally left off discussing verse 13 until now, which reminds us that when temptation comes, God will provide a way of escape. Would an enemy do that? No. He would set the trap and see to it that we not only fall into the trap, but we remain in the trap until we die. God is not like that. First of all, God did not set the trap. Satan did. God does not tempt man with evil. He allows us to be tempted, yes, but he does not tempt us to sin. But even though he doesn't tempt us, he always provides a way of escape from temptation so that we can bear it and come through the other side having not sinned. Now, recognizing the way of escape is sometimes difficult, but it's always there. Whether it's changing the channel on television, picking up our Bibles instead of watching the television, going for a walk to clear our head of any of the sinful thoughts that might have been creeping in, calling a friend for support, approaching God in prayer. 
The ways God provides us as a way of escape for temptation, unharmed, are numerous. He is our friend for doing so. We often view God, or people often view God, as this being who just can't wait to strike people down and cast them to hell. He is, again, not like that. He is a loving God who seeks all to repent. Will he punish the disobedient? Yes, he will. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't seek their repentance first. The people of Noah's day had multiple opportunities to repent, and so did the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't repent, and they were punished. But God did give them a chance to repent. And if God is our friend through temptation, he's also our friend through trials. Paul, David said in Psalms 31, verses 1 to 3, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your, bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. When we face trials, sadly, our habit sometimes is to isolate ourselves from others and from God. We allow the devil to sow deeds, seeds of doubt in our head as to whether God really loves us or whether God really cares for us. When we face trials, the best thing we can do is to pray to God, for it will focus our thoughts on what we have to do and petition God for help in doing it. David faced some terrible trials in his life. Yet what did he call God? His rock his refuge, his fortress of defense. Is that how we view God? But just as God is there with us in the bad times, he is also there with us in the good times. He is the one who blesses us. In James 1, verses 16 and 17, we read, Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every good thing in this life we have from God, whether it's physical blessings or spiritual blessings. Physical blessings are open to all, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not. Jesus said as much when he said that the sunshine and the rain come to the just and the unjust. However, spiritual blessings are only found in Christ, are only open to Christians. Some of those spiritual blessings include, but are not limited to, the promise to be heard in prayer, salvation from sin, and the hope of eternal life. God has been so good to us in providing for us all these things. Do we appreciate him for what he has done? And then finally, coming to verse 3, we see the results of what Jesus being all the world to us is, realizing that in the earth, we should want no better friend. When it comes to our earthly friends, even the best of earthly friends, they sometimes will fail us. They sometimes will betray our trust. They sometimes will mistreat us. Hopefully this isn't intentional, but sadly it does happen. Not with Jesus. Jesus will always be there in good times and in bad. Jesus will never mistreat us. He will always act in our best interests. And Jesus is trustworthy in that he will always accomplish what he said he would. And because of all that, we can place our trust in him now. And we can place our trust in him in the future, even as death approaches. In Psalms 9, 
Verses 9 and 10, David said, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. How we live our lives every day shows how much trust we put in the Lord. Do we walk around in fear, worrying about everything that we can't control? Or do we walk confidently, doing what I can do, but letting the Lord do what I can't do? David put his full trust in the Lord because the Lord is faithful. And we can therefore put our trust in the Lord too. If we do this, sure our lives may not be ones of wealth or fame or power. Perhaps they will, but more often they don't. But it can be a beautiful life with the best friend in the world. In the world. And it can be a beautiful life that has no end either. Sure, we will pass from this earth if Christ doesn't come first. But Christians understand that, this isn't, that death is not the end of our life. It's just the beginning of the next stage of our life, a stage that will never end. For we will have eternal life and eternal joy with God in heaven. What a promise. What? A reward. But that promise and reward is only for those who make Jesus all the world to them. Those who don't obey, Paul said in Romans 2 verses 8 and 9, that what awaited them was indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul who does, not, who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. Avoiding God's wrath is simple. For if we back up to verses 6 and 7 of Romans 2, we read, Who will render each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient, con patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Doing good here is not doing what we consider to be good, but doing what God considers to be good. And if we haven't begun on this road yet, doing good means believing in Jesus as the Son of God, who died on the cross for my sins. Doing good means, means repenting of my sins, turning my heart away from sin and towards God. Doing good means confessing my faith before others. And doing good means being baptized for the remission of my sins, immersed in water, so that I can have my sins forgiven by God. If we do this, we will have done good by doing what God said. But as Romans 2 implied, doing good does not end with baptism. We must patiently continue to do that which God declares good by walking faithfully until death so that we can receive eternal life. The question I have for all of us today is, is Jesus really all the world to me? If he isn't, and you're a Christian, correct this part of your life. Approach God in prayer and ask for forgiveness. But if he isn't yet, and you're not a Christian, you can correct that as well by obeying God completely, thus you're beginning your walk with him. Whatever the case is, won't you determine that Jesus be all the world to you today? I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.